In this video, we'll cover the standard level or core content from A1.2 on nucleic acids, focusing on the structure of DNA and RNA. So you've probably seen DNA before, you think it looks like this, and it does, but we'll go through more detail in a moment. And DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, so it's a shortened version, and it stores the hereditary or genetic information that is passed on from parent to offspring. It is a polymer, that means it's a very long molecule made of repeating units called nucleotides. More on that in a moment. Now, RNA is also used by viruses, not all, but some viruses instead of DNA, but it's important to remember that viruses are not living organisms, that all living organisms use the same molecule. They all use DNA to transmit hereditary information from one generation to the next. So let's zoom in on one of the repeating units of DNA, um, and this is called a nucleotide. And nucleotides, whether you're talking um, RNA or DNA, are going to have the same components. So they are going to have some kind of pentose sugar, and that is a five-sided sugar. And attached to that sugar, they are going to have a phosphate group. Now you're going to notice that I'm drawing these in a very particular way. The shapes are important and the attachment points are important, okay? So this phosphate group must be attached to this point on the pentose sugar. So that is important. Now, pentose sugar is kind of a vague term. This is a vague nucleotide. Once we get into RNA or DNA specifically, we'll replace the name of this pentose sugar with the name of the actual sugar. And then attached to this side of the pentose sugar, we're going to have one of four nitrogenous bases. Okay, so this is what a nucleotide looks like. You've got a five-sided sugar, your pentose sugar, connected to a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. If I put a lot of nucleotides together, then I can start building a polymer of either DNA or RNA. So here I've got three nucleotides and they're not attached just yet, um, but when we're ready for polymerization, okay, to attach these nucleotides together, a covalent bond is going to form between the phosphate of one nucleotide and the pentose sugar of the next, between the phosphate group and the sugar. And these are drawn with a solid line because they are covalent bonds. You can specify these bonds as being what's called a phosphodiester bond. That's just the name for this special bond between nucleotides, but it is a type of covalent bond, so we want to make sure that we're using a solid line. It's important that, again, it is a solid line and it's in the correct position that the phosphate group of one is attaching to this part of the pentose sugar of the other nucleotide. We'll use dashed lines later, but that will be for hydrogen bonds. So you'll find that this is kind of similar to the pattern we were using for drawing water molecules, solid lines for covalent bonds, dashed lines for hydrogen bonds. So in each nucleotide, we said a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. Okay, so we're gonna focus on what are the options for this nitrogenous base? Well, in DNA, there are four different bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. You will sometimes see them abbreviated with just their first letters. That's okay in your drawings, but in your written answers, you need to be able to write them out. In RNA, we're also going to find adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but we won't find thymine. It in, instead has a, a nitrogenous base called uracil. So again, these are all options for what nitrogenous base can be found on this part of a nucleotide. They can also be classified as either purines, that's adenine and guanine, or pyrimidines. So cytosine, uracil, and thymine are the three uh, pyrimidines. You'll notice that they have a slightly different structure. These are double rings, these are single rings. Okay, so that is important. So what do we need to know here? We need to know that there are options for nitrogenous bases. 
we know we need to know the names of those options and which one of these are purines and pyrimidines. So let's have a look at this diagram. This is what I think most people think of when they think of DNA. If I zoom in, or maybe I untwist that molecule and then I zoom in, I'll be able to see this phosphate sugar backbone and also the nitrogenous bases. Okay, and then if I zoom in even further, I'll be able to see the molecular components of each nucleotide. So again, here's each nucleotide, a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. Those nucleotides are connected together with covalent bonds. But what I wanna pay attention to here is the pattern of these nitrogenous bases. So the A's, T's, G's, and C's. This sequence works a little bit like binary code in computers. All those fun computer things that we do um, can be coded for with a system of zeros and ones. And that pattern of zeros and ones determines things that show up on the computer. You can tell I'm a biologist and not a computer scientist. In terms of the genetic code, different patterns of A's, T's, G's, and C's will produce different genetic mm, traits, okay? So it's that sequence of bases, that pattern of A's, T's, G's, and C's that determines the genetic code. It's what makes you slightly different than an alligator or slightly different from your neighbor that pattern of A's, T's, G's, and C's. Okay, so in a moment, we'll talk more about the difference between DNA and RNA. DNA, you've seen this before, is double-stranded. It looks a little bit like this. RNA is only single-stranded, but it doesn't really matter which one we're talking about. They are both long polymers made of repeating units of nucleotides. So if I wanna make a strand of DNA, or if I wanna make a strand of RNA, I must put those nucleotides together. I must be able to form one of those phosphodiester bonds between the phosphate group of one and the pentose sugar of the other. And that's going to use something called a condensation reaction. So condensation reactions, is just the removal of water to create a covalent bond. We'll see this in many different types of molecules. Here we'll look at the example of nucleotides. So water being H2O, Right, if I'm going to remove a water molecule, here's where it's gonna come from. I'm looking at this OH group here, which is part of the phosphate group, and this OH group or hydroxyl group that's part of the sugar. If I remove two H's, so that's the H2 part, and an O, that's the O part, that's going to leave one of the oxygens to be shared by both the phosphate group and the pentose sugar. So since they are sharing that oxygen in a way, um, that creates that covalent bond. And this is what we call this phosphodiester bond. We're connecting these nucleotides together by removing a water molecule. So I like to think of it like this. Here's my little trick. If I have five nucleotides that I want to join together, I need to remove one, two, three, four water molecules, and it's the removal of the water molecules that will help me to bind those together. In a moment, we're going to draw DNA, and you're going to notice that our two strands of DNA are going to run in parallel but opposite directions, and that is a property of DNA called anti-parallel. So the two strands, DNA is a double helix, two strands will run in opposite directions. What connects the two strands together are hydrogen bonds between nitrogenous bases, and they are going to follow the rule of complementary base pairing. So in complementary base pairing, adenine can only bind with thymine and guanine can only bind with cytosine. They almost, you can think of these as being like fitting together like puzzle pieces, okay? And so I think this will be easier once we draw this. So I've started out by just drawing three nucleotides that are not connected. I've labeled the phosphate group, the deoxyribose, and the nitrogenous base of just one of them. Again, because I know I'm drawing DNA, I don't need to put pentose sugar. I can write the name of the specific sugar, which for DNA is deoxyribose. I then am going to draw in my phosphodiester bonds, those covalent bonds between the phosphate group of one 
and the nucleotides are in the five-sided sugar or the deoxyribose of the other nucleotide. So covalent bond between the phosphate group of one and the deoxyribose of the other. And I'm just going to label one of those covalent or phosphodiester bonds. Now, my other strand of DNA, don't forget it's double-stranded, is going to look very similar, but it is going to run in the opposite direction. So for me, I'm going to have to work hard at this because I'm on my computer. If I were you, I would just turn your paper around. So I've gone ahead and drawn three nucleotides. Notice how they are looking kind of like upside down, right? So they are pointed in the other direction and they're not only upside down, but a mirror image. And that's because the two strands of DNA are attached via their nitrogenous bases. So more on that in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and draw in the covalent bonds, those phosphodiester bonds between the phosphate group of one nucleotide and the deoxyribose of another. I'm also going to label some of my nitrogenous bases with the complementary pairs. So we said that A pairs with T and G pairs with C, so on and so forth. Now, if you're drawing this on an exam, um, I would either try to write the full names of these nitrogenous bases, or over here in the side, I might say what each one means, like A stands for adenine, so on and so forth. You're also going to notice that I left a little bit of space in between them. That is because there are hydrogen bonds between these nitrogenous bases. And so for hydrogen bonds, I'm going to use a dotted line. And I'm going to label those. Now, between A and T, there are actually two hydrogen bonds, whereas between G and C, there are three hydrogen bonds. So I maybe want to show that bit of detail. Um, but this so far would be a very good picture of DNA if I'm asked to draw and label DNA. The one thing that I don't have on here is the label for a nucleotide. So I might go ahead and circle and label a nucleotide. And otherwise, this is a very good, um, like we would say like full mark drawing of a, a double-stranded DNA molecule. Now let's take a look at the structural differences between DNA and RNA. There are obviously some um, functional differences, but I'm just gonna focus in on how their structures are different. And actually, I'm gonna use this little graphic organizer. This is great if you have to compare and contrast because we have room for similarities and differences. So one of the similarities between DNA and RNA is that they are both polymers of nucleotides. They're both long strands of nucleotides. And in DNA, we're going to find that that is a double-stranded molecule, whereas in RNA, that is a single strand, okay? Um, let's see, in DNA, we're going to use deoxyribose sugar, whereas in RNA, it's ribose as the sugar in the nucleotide. And then I'm left with my base pairs. In both DNA and RNA, cytosine's complementary base pair is guanine. So that pair remains the same. In DNA, adenine is going to pair with thymine, and in RNA, ar <laughs> an RNA adenine is going to pair with uracil. So these are some structural differences I can expect between these molecules. Now, DNA structure tells us a lot about how it replicates. Replicates means I'm going to make a copy, and that's really important because if DNA is going to be the genetic information passed down to offspring, we need to make a correct copy. So DNA replication is what we call semi-conservative. So that'll look something like this, where if this is my original strand, um, these two strands are going to come apart and each of these strands is used as a template for synthesizing a new strand. So at the end of this process, I end up with two identical DNA molecules, each with one original strand and one new strand. And the reason why that's very important is because it follows the rules of complementary base pairing. So let's say in my original parent strand, it read this A, G, C, T. And that would mean that on the other parent strand, it would look like this T, C, G, A. 
So when those strands come apart, they can be used as a template to make a new strand. So that would be like this. So I would be using the complementary base pairs, again, following that rule. And as you can see, by the end of this process, I have two identical strands, each with one old strand and one new strand, and they retain the same genetic code that I had in that original DNA molecule. And this idea of complementary base pairing is really going to drive a lot of our learning, not only when it comes to DNA replication, but gene expression. So when we say a gene is expressed, what that means is that we're using the codes on DNA to synthesize a protein. And that protein synthesis is going to happen in several steps. We'll talk about that in another topic, but here's the basics. DNA is used as a template to make RNA, and that RNA is then translated into a protein. All of this, all of these steps follow the rules of complementary base pairing. So in theme A, this is all about unity and diversity. So the unity bit of this is that all living organisms use DNA. They all use these A's, T's, G's, and C's and these rules of complementary base pairing. We all have that in common. So what is it that drives the diversity of organisms on Earth? Well, that's also related to DNA. So there's a couple of different ways that DNA can result in genetic variation or diversity. First of all, DNA molecules can vary in length. We can have longer DNA molecules or shorter DNA molecules. And there's also almost an infinite number of possibilities for sequences. So one can read A, T, T, G, C, and the other one can read A, T, A, G, C, C and they will be very different or could be very different, okay? So the pattern of those A's, T's, G's, and C's makes for lots of different possible sequences. Now, how do I use DNA to store all of those different things in my cells? It seems like I have a lot of information I have to make space for, and that's true. The key here is that DNA is very thin. It's only two nanometers. A nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. So that's very small. If DNA is only two nanometers, it means that I can actually take a very long DNA molecule and scrunch it up to fit it within a cell. So even the tiniest organisms can hold billions of these base pairs, A's, T's, G's, and C's. And you can start to imagine the diversity that I can produce, even if I'm just using those four letters. Letters. Now let's go back to that concept of unity. One of the things that makes all living organisms the same is that the same codes that end up on RNA are interpreted the same way in every organism. And we call that a universal genetic code. That doesn't mean every organism's code is identical. What it means is that that code is interpreted in an identical way, a universal way. So this is discussed much more in depth um, in the topic on protein synthesis, but the basic rundown is this, that these codes on the RNA are going to come from codes on DNA, but they're going to call for the same amino acid sequence. And that doesn't matter if you're a person, a butterfly, a tree, it doesn't matter. Okay, but that conservation of the genetic code, one of the reasons why that is in this particular topic is because it's evidence that all life arose from a common ancestor. So the easiest way of explaining why the genetic code is interpreted the same way in every organism is if all of the living organisms on earth came from the same common ancestor. So again, this theme is all about unity and diversity. We'll talk more about this process in particular in another topic, but it's important to note for now that this genetic code is the same or interpreted the same for all organisms on earth.